Religious persecution is a situation where your life is literally put in jeopardy simply because of what you believe or what you might want to share in your faith, and your life's at risk. We as Americans face religious discrimination. We do not face religious persecution like we see in other places in the world. The level of persecution is on the rise. It's being reported more, we're seeing it, and we can see the imagery, we can see the brutality. There's an element of violence or physical harm. Persecution in other countries is very different. It's a matter of life and death. We're talking about situations where people are put in jail, threatened with death or life imprisonment simply because of who they are and what they believe. Don't even use the word persecution. I use the term religious cleansing now because it's the eradication of the entire Christian presence in country after country. Every successive movement is becoming more vicious, more barbaric, and more savage than the previous one. People are being killed because of their faith, brutally murdered because of their faith, being sold into slavery because of their faith. There's a much larger issue here. For the last five or six years, there's been tremendous persecution, almost a genocide. Now we're seeing, of course, the rise of Islamic extremism. They're out to cause total death and destruction. There's religious persecution all over right. that country, but they're most harsh on people who turn away from Islam. We have to be cognizant of the fact that globally, persecution is as alive and well as it has ever been. These techniques, these tactics, this brutality is not new. It's just now in our living rooms, and we're seeing it in our own nations. There are six Jews left in the whole of Iraq. It was the biggest Jewish community in the Middle East, and now we have six. It's like it's, uh, it's open season on Christians. Basically killing infidels so they can go and get their reward. Level of brutality is hitting a point that you, you didn't see before. It used to be people get arrested, they may even be executed. But now being burned alive, uh, it's, it seems medieval, uh, but it's happening in 2014 and it's getting worse. This is a global attack and civilians are the targets. It is really our solemn duty to stand up and stand in the gap for our brothers and sisters. We have lost everything in the last few days. Literally. Saeed became a believer in 2000. Soon after that, he started house churches, underground churches. He was arrested uh, by the intelligence police and he was told as long as he discontinued any house church movement, um, that they would allow him to freely move back and forth uh, into Iran, see his family, his parents, his siblings. And one of the intel intelligence police even suggested, why don't you do humanitarian efforts? So when he came back in 2009, we were praying and we both had a huge heart for the orphans. The government actually um, um, gave us approval. Between 2009 and 2012, Saeed traveled into Iran more than nine times. He followed all the guidelines he was given by the government. Unfortunately, he was stopped. His passport was taken as he was leaving to come back to the U.S. He was under house arrest for two months. Uh, from July to September, and in September of 2012, the house was raided, uh, his parents' house that he was staying at in Iran, and he was taken by Revolutionary Guards. I got in touch with the State Department immediately. They, it was the hardest phone call of my life because I expected something, and they said, um, there's nothing we can do. Saeed had traveled back and forth to Iran several times since 2009, and this was the first instance where before he left, he said, Nagme, should anything happen to me, I want you to reach out to this news reporter who he had connected to via Facebook. She'll know what to do. Lisa Daftari, who's been great on Saeed's case, called my cell phone and said, Tiffany, I don't know who else to give 
this client to you except for the ACLJ? Would you be willing to talk to her? So I immediately called and said, this is what's happened. We don't know where he is. We're on the phone with Nag Mabedini, his wife uh, here in the United States. We started working on his situation within 24 hours of his arrest. By the time Saeed was returned home and put under house arrest, we represented Saeed internationally. From that moment, of course, it's a highly intense situation. We step in both as, as advocates, somebody who can step in, remove from the emotion, to be able to provide objectivity to what is a situation that's very hard to have clarity in when it's one of your family members who's been taken or missing. It was also her Christian counselor who sat and prayed with her through a very difficult time. I don't know if people realize how crucial ACLJ was in our life. I believe it was God's um, provision that ACLJ had already dealt with um, legal issues in Iran. They already knew a lot of the legal system, a lot of the, they had, were very familiar with, with the Iranian system, the court. Said Abedini's case was not the first case, not the first apostasy case, not the first death penalty case we handled. We handled the case for another Iranian, Yusef Narakani. Pastor Yusuf Nader Khan, he was an Iranian, uh, is an Iranian Christian pastor, and he was in prison because of his work as a Christian, the house churches uh, that these Christians are involved in. And it's questionable, even under Iranian law, if that's even illegal. There are a number of Christians imprisoned in Iran only because of their faith. They came to us because he was in a dire situation. They're not attorneys, so this, a smaller ministry said, can you help? Can you do something? He's on death row. Uh, he's been given a death sentence, so not just a prison sentence, but a death sentence. Is there anything you can do? And so we launched an international campaign. A Christian pastor in Iran imprisoned for nearly three years, facing a death sentence because of his Christian faith. July 8, 2012 marked the 1,000th day of captivity for Christian pastor Youssef Nardakani, facing execution for simply becoming a Christian. When Iranian officials demanded that he recant his faith in Jesus Christ or die, he responded with two words, I cannot. It is vital to keep Pastor Youssef in the spotlight and the pressure on Iran. At the American Center for Law and Justice, we are doing all that we can in this country and abroad to secure his freedom. Our Tweet for Youssef campaign reaches more than 2.2 million Twitter accounts daily, spanning the globe, connecting 200 countries around the world, calling attention to the plight of Pastor Youssef. We also know the importance of the power of prayer, and so does Pastor Youssef. In a letter he released from prison not long ago, he specifically thanked everyone who has, quote, asked for my release or campaigns and human rights activities which are going on against the charges which are applied to me, end quote. He also had one simple request, pray for me, he wrote. Please continue to pray for Pastor Youssef and all those who face persecution because of their Christian faith. When the regime gets more radical, as it was under uh, Pastor Yusuf Nader Khani when, when he was in prison, uh, they not only put him in jail and, or in prison, but they sentenced him to death. And they charged him with also being an apostate. That means someone who left Islam. So he was a Muslim and he converted to Christianity. In his trial, his death penalty trial, this is how much it is about religion and nothing else, and about faith and nothing else. They gave him three opportunities to renounce his faith, and he would have walked out. So not only would he have not faced the death penalty, he would have walked out of, of prison. And the court case would have been over if he would have just said, I don't believe in Christ, I'm now a Muslim, gone through the Muslim prayer, and that would be it. Kenan Andrew White is a great hero of mine. He um, created a church, uh, St. George's, um, in Baghdad with the remnants of the Christian community there and established clinics and other aid programs to help them and to help the few remaining Jews and to help Muslims in the area. And things have been very difficult recently. There's been a major increase in violence. A lot of our people have started fleeing again because they feel under attack and they are being attacked. And another problem is that a lot of our people who fled before to Syria are now fleeing back. And we've had to help these people who've come, come back with absolutely nothing. 
no money, no house, no food. So we're having to do a lot for them as well. He has a love for these Iraqi Christians that is sincere, it is real, and it's deep. But he also has a love for the Jewish people in the state of Israel. So it's this unique blend that makes Andrew White really who he is. Our church has grown from literally nothing when we opened it. The only signs of life were some pigeons flying around. And that the church developed to be a church of six and a half thousand people. We had a school, an incredible clinic, and a hospital, all full medical facilities. We did everything, and we still do. And then a few years ago, things started getting bad. He is um, a very tall uh, presence there, a big presence. Um, he's a charismatic person and he's from the West. So he is a very much a target and so is his congregations. He's a reconciliation guy. He's someone that works with others to come into common ground. Until a month ago, none of us knew what the Islamic State even stood for. We did not know ISIS. We lived together, Christians and Muslims. We helped each other, we cared for each other. And suddenly this group appears. This group who wants to slaughter all of our people. Who want to murder them, massacre them, remove them from their homeland. ISIS has destroyed the Christian community inside Iraq. It's an unbelievable reign of terror that has been unleashed on the Christians of Iraq. All I can do is say, I won't leave you. Because I know for many of those people, if they don't leave, they will probably be killed. We need people to realize that this is such an extreme form of terrorist activity that what we have worked for and achieved is just being banished overnight. Well, we're seeing um, a rise of is Islamic extremism this is not only happening in Iraq, but also in Pakistan, Sudan, northern Nigeria, Somalia. The entire church communities, Christian communities, wiped out in places like Syria and Iraq. Where, that's our history. That's our heritage. Those are the places we point to as the birthplace of, of Christianity as we know it. And they want to eradicate our history there. So they want to not just kill the people, they want to destroy the buildings. You see that right now in the Middle East especially in the Middle East, but also in Africa, Northern Africa particularly, where people are literally being hung because of their faith. And of course, if you take a situation with a group like ISIS, being beheaded, crucified, simply because they're Christians and will not forcibly be converted to another religion, in that particular case, Islam. Uh, you know, the situation in Iraq, this is one of the most robust Christian communities left in the Middle East. They fled because they were targeted by various jihadi groups. There are more Iraqi Christians now in Chicago than there are in the whole of Iraq. ISIS's purpose is to establish a global caliphate, putting everyone under Sharia Islamic law with no exceptions. You would think that 1400 years um, that this would have been, you know, gone, long gone, but it's coming back, it's coming back with vengeance, uh, with far less even mercy than those original Islamist invaders. We're seeing it now 
more than we ever saw before. We're going through a period of a great wave of persecution. In fact, Pope Francis has said recently that there's more persecution today than there was in the first century of Rome. The Islamic recruiters for, for al-Qaeda-tied groups like al-Shabaab, they're going into the, into the slums, into the poor neighborhoods of Nairobi and, and, uh, and other major cities in Kenya, and they're offering up jobs. They're saying it's job training. And these are people that don't have a lot of future, that don't necessarily have a lot going for them in life, and then ultimately they end up at a terrorist training camp where they're indoctrinated. There's no reasoning. that They do not understand reasoning. They think Allah said it, and therefore we are his emissaries, and we've got to do it. ووفقهم ومكنهم لتحقيق غايتهم وإن أردتم موعود الله فجاهدوا في سبيل الله If you see the brutality that is engaged in by ISIS what is the commonality with all of these regimes they really target Christians For the first time there will be no since Christianity there will be no Christmas in 2014 in the entire area of Nineveh um, because ISIS has um, driven out every last Christian and closed every last church. Thousands and thousands of refugees have had to flee Nineveh. They've got no homes. They live in churches on the floor. They live in plastic tents. They've got nothing. Christians, uh, at best, are treated like second-class citizens, or at worst, like in Iraq today and in Syria. No matter what they do, um, they cannot exist. Their churches cannot remain open. They must be killed or driven out. What we have worked for and achieved is just being banished overnight. The stories that we hear about here in the U.S. are the ones that are the most shocking and the most brutal and the ones that really, they, they shock the conscience. You almost can't believe. Uh, it's not just a, a simple murder, if you put it that way, but it's, it's done in such a barbaric way that we all take a step back and say, this is how poorly uh, people view Christians. They don't value their life at all. At the same time, there are Muslims who are wanting just to live a life there are many of these people who are being uh, annihilated as well. They are being killed in Mosul. They're being killed in these other cities because they, they won't join ISIS. They just want to live their life. And so they have been executed as well. So if there's Christians, no question, but there's also Muslims that are suffering too under this. They are saying this is not Islam. This is not what we stand for. And this is not what we have developed in our relationship together over the years. We love each other, we respect each other, and now there is nothing there but total isolation and destruction. Not stopping ISIS is not an option. ISIS has to be crushed. They have to be completely eliminated. You have to defeat them militarily, you have to defeat them politically, you have to defeat them in the, in the hearts and minds of Muslims, and that's a part of this process, it has to be eliminated. A Muslim mob in Pakistan that's burning a couple alive in between two pieces of metal, and there's a crowd cheering that. I mean, you're talking about front lines of extremism where there are Christians being killed almost on a daily basis. People are still getting killed, people are still getting tortured. You've got a combination of lethality capability that previous generations that were on an Islamic conquest did not have, weaponry, sophistication, telecommunications, social media. ISIS is serious about its business of mass destruction. And whether we are in Washington, New York, or London, we are all at risk. Instead of dealing with slings and arrows, or even bullets, you could be dealing with a situation where you have weapons of mass destruction. They have killed people. They have chopped their heads off. They have cut little children in half. It is so painful. These were people that we loved. These were our people. And they have gone.
The United States is the strongest government in the world. We have the best military in the world. We have the best intelligence in the world. And if you put our intelligence capabilities together with our allies and really determine who our allies are, there is no doubt we have the capability to stop this and end it. When the U.S. speaks, the world listens, even if it's a, an enemy of the United States, like a North Korea, the world has to pay attention. We, I think, have a very important role. We, we finance, we do so much foreign funding, billions of dollars a year is going out from the United States to these countries. And that's what, why I think we have to make decisions, ultimately, very soon in the future. How much are we going to let these countries get away with persecuting people uh, before we say, we're gonna cut your funding off? You know, many governments are self-conscious about their human rights records. Not all, but, but many are. And that's important to use that um, spotlight, shining the spotlight to show the injustice of these governments. But then you ask a question. So who are our allies? Turkey's a member of NATO, yet the greatest funnel for people leaving Europe to join with ISIS, they flow right through Turkey. I think the US government can play a very important role uh, with uh, these cases in Pakistan because Pakistan and, uh, and the United States are allies. We all know that money has strings attached, so maybe let's put another string to it and say, let's release these people, these people who are accused, of, falsely accused of, uh, of the uh, blasphemy, uh, blasphemy cases, and they're spending their lives in prison. So I think it's important that the U.S. government brings up uh, these issues with, with the Pakistani government. We give billions of dollars of aid to Pakistan. Turkey is a NATO partner. But what are we getting in return for this? Nothing. Let's start exercising the power of the purse. This is the perfect time for the United States to put conditions, human right conditions, on our aid. If you support terror, if you give a safe haven to terror, if you are aiding and abetting a terrorist, you don't get U.S. aid, period. Our founders intentionally set this government up to have stress between the branches. We at the ACLJ use that stress to our advantage. The executive branch often does not want to engage these cases of religious persecution. The legislative branch, because they're closer to the people, are often more inclined to engage them. Therefore, we often leverage the legislative branch to force the executive branch to action. Well, there are political actions we can take, and uh, one is using the bully pulpit. Our president, our secretary of state, should be raising these cases every time they have an opportunity. In order to make a difference in some cases, we need people who are free from religious persecution to advocate for those who are not. And this is, this is why the tie between America and the rest of the world is so important. We live under the protections of the First Amendment. Those who don't, those who are persecuted for their faith, need someone to stand in the gap for them. At the ACLJ, one of the main things that we do is give our members an opportunity to advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves. Well, one of the things that we do consistently is make sure that our elected officials know exactly where we stand as American citizens on these issues. You know, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, everybody quotes the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and that's all in there. But there's also a provision in the First Amendment that says you're allowed to petition the government for a redress of a grievance. What I think is the most effective advocacy when it comes to our grassroots support, and that's the petition. That's getting people, so we can say 300,000 people uh, in a week care about this issue, have spoken out, and we take that information. It's, it's not just a bunch of signatures online or by phone that you call. We really do take that to members of Congress, to government officials around the world, and we lay it out for, okay, this is how many people care about this. This is how many people in your congressional district or your state care about this. One of the beautiful things about the American way of government is that it is specifically designed to be responsive to the people. When the ACLJ is able to build a petition of hundreds of thousands of names, it inspires action from Congress, especially when we can show each individual member who on that petition actually has an opportunity to vote for them. Keeping Saeed Abedini alive is a big part of the strategy right now. We've heard from over 600,000 people from around the globe, and we let lawmakers around the globe know that. Wow. 
But first, our world lead, a man in prison who may feel as if he's forgotten, but he has not been forgotten by his friends and family. But hopefully he's also not been forgotten by his government. Has the president been kept uh, apprised of his situation? I don't have a statement. I'll have to take the question. You know, the president is obviously updated on a variety of issues with regards to Iran, but I don't have anything specific for you on that. There's always a reaction that you kind of say, when you hear about something like this, like Saeed's situation, and you, you get involved in it, and he's, made, you know, he's been arrested and put under house arrest for being a Christian, you want to kind of jump, and you have this reactionary feeling that, okay, I, I need to jump to the news, I need to tell the news. Anytime you get a case where there's either a death penalty or the equivalent of a death penalty for someone being persecuted for their faith, you need time to analyze the situation and also work intergovernmentally. In other words, we needed to find out what the United States State Department, in Sayyid Abedini's case, what they were willing to do. How far would the State Department go in seeking his release? What international agencies they would bring to bear on his situation? That takes time. Timing is very important in all of these cases. In Saeed's situation, we really did wait as long as possible to try and get it resolved before going public. And what we have a balance. The balance is this. Is it going to put them at more risk by going public? Or are we at a point now where there's so much risk that going public may be the only reason they stay alive? And to this day, uh, I think that the only reason Saeed Abedini hasn't been killed in prison and is still uh, the possibility of coming home is because we decided to go public when we did. It was a very um, difficult decision to go public. We waited three months uh, from the day he was physically taken, which anyone wants to immediately call media and say, my husband's gone, we don't know where he is, but we waited, we were patient, and we wanted to try other avenues before going forward. And we went public because Saeed was being tortured, because he was being beaten, and we knew that although that, that would corner the Iranian government into having to find a solution very publicly, it also could potentially protect him from those beatings, from that torture. It was right before Christmas uh, of 2012 that we, just, we, we knew he had a court date. Once you get a court date in the, in the revolutionary court system, you're gonna be found guilty. The question is, how long will your sentence be and will it be a death sentence and what happens next? So we knew we had to go public. And welcome back to Hannity, a 32-year-old American pastor, the Reverend Saeed Abedini has been detained by one of Iran's most notorious prisons since late September for charges that have not been made public other than the fact that he is a convert Christian. Friends are growing for an American pastor who remains locked up inside an Iranian prison. His alleged crime, he's a Christian. Well, for Christmas, this should be the most joyous time of the year, but one American family is spending the season fighting to get a pastor freed from prison, 32-year-old Reverend Saeed Abedini. Jay, not very different from what we see happening. Coptic Christians are being persecuted in Egypt. Right. Uh, a lot of Christians in the Muslim world, this is not uncommon. It's happening more and more, as a matter of fact, as we yep. see the rise of radicalism. Well, I, I heard about it on the media, uh, like most Americans, and I was just uh, appalled and shocked, but I also thought, well, with, with this media attention, uh, he'll be getting out of, of jail mm -hmm. soon. Uh, they're bound to release him. Uh, why would they want this bad publicity? but it just doesn't seem to affect the Iranians. It's like they don't care. Let's talk about uh, this pastor who remains in jail. He's being held there simply by the fact that he's a Christian? Th that's basically it. I, he, pastor Saeed is 32 years old. He's been in the worst prison, the most notorious prison in Tehran, Avin prison, uh, since September. And so it's been very difficult, and especially during Christmas time, there's a big hole in our family. An Iranian-American pastor imprisoned in Iran is set to go on trial January 21st. Although he has been in custody since September, the criminal charges that he faces date back to the year 2000. That's when Abedini converted from Islam to Christianity, an act which carries the death sentence in Iran. What is known about the judge or judges, David Lee? Well, this judge has been called one of Iran's hanging judges. This is another example of Muslims persecuting Christians. It happened in Egypt. It happened in Nigeria. It's happened all over that area, and you've got to stop As it. As for Abedini, he remains steadfast and says he is prepared to hang for his faith in Jesus. His supporters are urging Washington to do more to pressure Iran to set him free. Well, this sounds very ominous. An American pastor from Idaho disappears from a jail in Iran. Now, the pastor's family says that he is missing. This Thursday, they went to the prison and he was not there. Um, they don't know where he is. As of now, there was no notice and uh, we're hoping to be able to find out where he is soon. 
Jordan, either it's a bureaucratic mess up um, or they're incompetent or they have done something um, sinister. Yeah, I think with Iran, you assume the worst, but you hope for the best. Saeed was charged and convicted of attempting to undermine the national security of the Islamic Republic of Iran by his work with what was called illegal gatherings back in the early 2000s. That, by the way, is typically what these governments will do because they view a Christian as a national security threat. Now, we look at that in the West and say that's absolutely absurd. So the initial charge in any of these cases is usually focused on an issue of national security. The illegal gatherings that, that they thought were going to overthrow the government were house churches that were legal. He had no legal problems then, you know? So over a decade ago, he wasn't getting arrested there. He wasn't getting in trouble. He was a convert from Islam and had a Christian wedding in Iran that was government, uh, government okayed. It got the, you know, normal government approval for a wedding. The family ultimately left Iran and, and returned back to Nagme's home in the United States. But, but his charge and his, his conviction is being a national security threat to Iran. And, and the act there, what he did to become that national security threat was being a Christian. فجاء النصارى يطلبون هذا العهد ويطلبون هذا العقد واجتمعنا معهم وكان ممثلا هناك يحضر عن الخليفة البغدادي وإذا بهم قال نعرض عليكم الإسلام فإن لم تقبلوا فإننا نعرض عليكم الجزية التي أمر بها القرآن فإن لم تقبلوا فليس بيننا وبينكم إلا القتل والقتال وإذا بهم يقولون نريد الجزية the word jizya is different from the word daraib. Daraib means taxes. Jizya means punishment or penalty. And it, it is only applied to Jews and Christians, whom they call the people of the book. Number one, you can pay a tax. But these people have no money, so they can't pay the tax. Number two, you can convert. You could leave your faith in Christianity or whatever the particular religion is, convert to Islam, and that will keep you alive. Or three, you'll be executed. That may be by hanging, being, being shot, by being crucified, by being beheaded. They tend to go for beheadings because they use that as a recruiting tool. And there are not really many options here because these people don't have money to pay a tax and live in peace. There was a, a certain amount of protection, even from Assad in Syria, there's been a certain amount of protection for minorities, even the Jewish community. Right. But uh, now uh, with, with uh, Saddam Hussein gone, uh, with uh, the war in, in, uh, we see in Syria, uh, there is no protection anymore. These people you cannot deal with. They will not talk with you. There is nothing you can reasonably achieve. You can only survive. You can only function by the supernatural power of God. You can give a person a chance to recant. Uh, and if they do, they could be forgiven. But if they refuse to recant, then they're to be executed. And we see this happen in the Middle East where, where people have come to faith in Christ and it's the duty of the family uh, to force them to recant. If they don't, then the family executes them. And we have seen a number of cases that over the years. In many Muslim countries today, um, where there are minorities, Christian, uh, Jewish, um, minorities, um, even women um, who are not minorities, are treated like second-class citizens under Islamic law. Um, they, their testimony is, le is worth less or weighted less than a Muslim man's in a court. Muslims have a voice in a court proceeding that is elevated much higher than any other faith. In fact, many other faiths, including Christianity, it's hard to get them in trial. We have to take international efforts to get these cases in trial. And then you put on top of that, in a Sia Bibi's case, a female. Well, that's even a lower rung. Um, they do not, do not have the same rights or guarantees of property. Um, in Iran, the Baha'is and the Christians can be shut out of jobs. The Baha'is have no rights at all. In fact, if anyone takes their property or murders them, they're not even prosecuted. If someone accuses you of saying something against the Prophet, which could be as benign in Western context as saying Jesus is the true Prophet, that's blasphemy. The penalty is death.
A Pakistani court is upholding the death sentence for Aja Bibi, the Christian woman accused of blaspheming the prophet Muhammad. Asia Bibi, 45 years old and mother of five, is the first woman to be condemned to death under Pakistan's blasphemy laws. She insulted the prophet Muhammad, her accusers say. That was enough for the local cleric to demand the police lock her up and put her on trial. Grief and agony of two young girls who wait to see if the Pakistani government will execute their jailed mother. Whenever I see her picture, I cry, says 12-year-old Isham. Her husband, Ashik, and their children are in hiding, sheltered by a small Christian colony away from their village. Um, Asia Bibi is a Christian woman on death row. She's been in prison in Pakistan since 2009. Um, she uh, is accused of blasphemy. Um, the charges against her were not able to be repeated in court because uh, that itself would be another act of blasphemy. So there was no evidence against her and she was convicted and sentenced to death. And Pakistan is an example also where you have an individual case, a Sia Bibi, a mother of five, gets into a situation where she's giving water to a Muslim woman. So her crime is that she gives something to drink to a Muslim woman who thinks that's unclean and then makes a condescending statement about Jesus. And Asiya Bibi's a Christian, and she says Jesus is the true prophet. And for that, she is now sentenced to death by hanging. This is what we see too often, is that when people don't like something about a Christian, or they're, they're upset at a Christian, or there's a dispute, business dispute over a Christian, uh, what you'll see in these countries that have these laws, they're, they're abused. Uh, so someone says, well, let's see, they, I don't know what I could actually get the, uh, charge them with, so I'll just say they blasphemed the prophet, and I'll get two of my friends to say they did, and now they won't just be in trouble, they'll be on, uh, on death row. Blasphemy laws were promulgated in, in the 80s in Pakistan, and generally what they prohibit is any insulting remarks about the Islamic religion. But the most notorious of, of the laws is Section 295C of, this, of the Penal Code, it, which says that whoever by words, either spoken or written, or by any visible representation or innuendo or insinuation, defiles the sacred name of the Prophet Muhammad shall be punished with death. And a defamation of Islam is very subjective, very amorphous, and can be used without any evidence. In fact, it's blasphemous to produce evidence in some of these cases. Well, under Islamic law, for instance, converting from Islam to Christianity is a capital offense. So the penalty for that is death. So they will take the elements of the Quran, apply it to the law, and then base their criminal code off of that. The other thing we should be doing is pushing back, for example, on the blasphemy law in Pakistan, demanding reform of that law. It, of course, it should be rescinded, but the first step is some kind of reform, stopping the, the, um, the capital punishment of blasphemy when there's no evidence in most of these cases, when there are, are ulterior motives in most of these cases. I think the U.S. government can play a very important role. Uh, it's important that we bring up these cases and uh, talk to the Pakistani officials who are supposedly our friends, uh, to, to talk to them and, and, and make sure that justice is provided in these cases and, and p people are not falsely accused. It's not just the United States that can take action against the implementation of blasphemy laws in Pakistan, or anywhere else for that matter. It's an international effort. These blasphemy laws conflict with international human rights norms and international human rights law. And the governments around the world need to insist that when a government signs a treaty or signs onto a declaration of human rights, that those human rights are fulfilled. It seems like reform for, for the blasphemy law in Pakistan cannot come from within. Those who try get murdered. So they need a strong voice like the United States to speak, to push back, to speak up and say this is an injustice. New concerns for the safety of American pastor Saeed Abedini sentenced this week to eight years in Iran's most brutal prison accused of illegally practicing his Christian faith. Past inmates report beatings and torture and mock executions 
One of those inmates was Marina Neymar. What is it like inside? It's um, living hell. Upon arrival, they blindfold you. Then they take you for interrogation. They ask you a few questions. Then they never like the answers that you give. Then they take you to the torture room. They tie you up and they torture you. Case is completely bogus, but once again, the U.S. State Department and the president seem powerless. So where's the Obama administration? Where's the U.N.? Where's the State Department? The Obama administration needs to come out publicly. Why is the White House not more involved in this case? I think it's outrageous what we've seen from the State Department so far. We're not seeing a more uh, aggressive action from our government. I, and I hope that to see more of that, and not just from our government, but all over the world, because it, this is a violation of his human rights, and Iran is violating that right. And Iran needs to be accountable to that. In a letter to his wife, he said he had been beaten. Maybe you ask, what is the secret of being so happy in such a hard situation? Forgiveness and a change of attitude. When we forgive, we become free and we become messengers of peace and reconciliation and goodness. He also talks about not receiving medical treatment for the internal bleeding that he's suffered from beatings. Are you concerned that he will not survive his prison sentence? Yes, very much. Every day is a, is a battle, a survival battle, and that's why we've been fighting to get him out as soon as possible. Uh, we found out over the weekend we were asked to uh, participate, as well as Nagme Ambedini, Pastor Saeed's wife, in a hearing before the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, which is completely bipartisan in the House of Representatives. Many of the members of this commission, including the two co-chairs, were part of the bipartisan letter last month to Secretary Kerry asking him to do more. So this is not a Republican-Democrat issue, but instead really Congress and the, who's doing uh, everything they can, but the administration who's been ignoring them. So we're going to actually be able to testify to present Saeed's case to the House of Representatives, to the, to the commission, and also the State Department's been invited to participate. So they will also be there and subject to the questioning of these members of Congress who have asked for more. What is really significant when you've got an individual who is facing a death penalty or life imprisonment in these prisons in these countries, which is effectively a death penalty, is to bring the facts of their case to bear and show the human side of what the real consequences of inaction on our government's behalf would result in. And that's what you do at congressional hearings. Uh, the hearing will begin. I want to thank all of you for being here today to discuss the worsening plight of religious minorities in Iran. Just by way of example, Nagme Abedini got to appear before the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission to advocate for her husband's freedom. Uh, that was a way that we could be a nexus between the people who signed our petition that were advocating for Syed's uh, release and members of Congress who wanted to do something but didn't necessarily know what to do. We were able to put those two things together. We were able to have this hearing where, where Nagme went and advocated for her husband's freedom. And as a result of that hearing, more people know the name Saeed Abedini than any other case of religious persecution around the world today. Just so the commission understands, we've heard from over a half a million people, actually 512,537 people in just a few weeks that are concerned about his situation. Uh, actor Woody Allen once said that 80% of success is showing up. Yet even after requesting only 20 minutes of their time for testimony and questions, the Department of State remained unresponsive and ultimately said, said no. Unfortunately, this is hardly an exception. Uh, there's been a disappointment on human rights. Uh, in this, this is the second hearing in less than a year that the commission has convened to highlight human rights abuses in particular countries, abuses which have resulted in the imprisonment of an American citizen. In both cases, the administration seemed disinterested at, at best. More broadly speaking, there seems to be an inherent bias in the State Department sometimes on these issues uh, that dealing with the issue of uh, faith. We've had some dialogue with the State Department over the last several months, and I will be honest, Mr. Chairman, it has not been pleasant. The lack of concern, the lack of engagement has been problematic in our work to free Pastor Saeed Abedini. The problem in his case is that the State Department is AWOL. They are absent without leave. They are missing. They did not show up today. They did not show up at the United Nations. They act as if they are embarrassed about Mr. Abedini's faith. Rather, all 27 EU countries at the United Nations called for the release of Pastor Saeed Abedini. The United States was silent. Someone at the U.S. State Department is taking out references to Saeed Abedini. It is not the Department of Religious uh, Freedom. It is not the, the ambassador at large, whose office has not yet been fully empowered to engage this situation. 
and like they did for Pastor Youssef Nader Khani, who they have done more for than they have an American citizen. Yesterday morning, as Nagma Abedini was boarding a flight to Washington, D.C., she received a call from the desk officer at Near Eastern Affairs. This is the U.S. State Department. The desk officer that on the first day she called, within 24 hours of her husband being arrested by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, told her on the phone, there is nothing the United States government can do for you. When that desk officer made the comment, someone from the Department of International Religious Affairs, who works for Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook, tried to break in. This desk officer cut them off, said, I have authority. There's nothing we can do to help. You can keep us updated with the facts if you like. She received the same phone call from that desk officer moments before boarding a plane, after we have informed the U.S. State Department and this officer specifically to stop contacting the client we represent as her attorneys, as the family's attorneys, without us on the phone. Did it moments before her flight and said, you've never asked us for help. You've never asked us for help. Your attorneys may have communicated. You may have been on those phone calls even. But you've never asked us for help. As you can see now, they knew this hearing was about to happen and are trying to cover their tracks. And I think the State Department's refusal to appear before this committee today is extremely troubling and frankly offensive. It's offensive, and I look at it first from a legal standpoint. Sure, it's offensive from a legal standpoint. But it's offensive to Nagme Abedini the wife of this pastor. And if his children were old enough to understand the scope of what was going on, it would be offensive to them as well. That their government, the State Department, snubbed this commission. And that cannot be seen as anything less than a wanton disregard to stand up and speak out for someone who cannot speak out for himself right now. And I also believe it reveals a stunning lack of concern for protecting human rights and religious freedom. The failure to appear today and to testify, frankly, is inexcusable. On July 28th, he was taken off a bus by the Revolutionary Guard. He was put under house arrest for two months. Um, I remember our kids would uh, continually be able to hear his voice and see him on the computer on Skype. And the day he was taken, and we didn't know where he was for a week, they kept coming to the computer and saying, Mommy, can we see Daddy? Can we hear his voice? And I kept saying, No, we can't. You know, I, I couldn't explain to them why that he was physically taken to prison. And finally, they kept saying, does Daddy not love us anymore? Does Daddy not want to hear our voice anymore? And I had to tell them that he was in prison because he loved Jesus and that he loved them very much. And he was looking for the day to come back and to come into bed. Our family nightmare began in September of 2012. And we've been fighting for his freedom since. As mentioned earlier, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, silence in the face of evil in itself is evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. I must say I'm disappointed with our government. I'm disappointed that our president and our state department has not fully engaged in this case. Disappointed that this great country is not doing more to free my husband, a U.S. citizen. I expect more from our government. But I'm hoping and I'm asking for help. It was told that I have not asked directly for help, but I've pleaded many times, many times I've asked the U.S. government to do whatever it can to free my husband from that prison simply because he converted from Islam to Christianity and he's a Christian and his human right is being broken and is being violated. And we, um, our family needs your help. Our family needs your support. But I just want to thank all of the, uh, the five witnesses, uh, you know, particularly, I appreciate, you know, you know. But the commission will stay with this thing until the release takes place. They were absent without leave. They were AWOL. And that was a message not only to the Congress, but it was also a message to Nagme Abedini. And it was frankly a message to our members around the world that the United States government wouldn't travel 2.3 miles down the road to testify to Congress. Now, the truth of the matter is, they got a lot of flack for that. 
and the end result of that was a significant high-level meeting, but their not showing up became a global concern. When Nagme Abedini and Jay and Jordan went before the committee and publicly asked the State Department to do, there was a shift in how they responded. They really had no choice. When the wife of the person who is in prison comes forward and says, my husband's case would be benefited with public attention, with the, with the attention of the United States government on it, they really had no choice but to take that approach. The simple fact is that this hearing shows our system really does work when people speak out. I mean, during the course of a two, two and a half hour hearing with just a couple of witnesses, we went from a situation where the State Department didn't even send someone a few blocks down the street to appear at the hearing uh, to a point where they were actually scrambling to meet with Nagme Abedini. The, the chairman of the committee got a phone call during the hearing asking for a meeting with Nagme later that afternoon. So the bottom line is, the system works if enough people speak out and we amplify their voice, results do happen. What I went in there to do was tell the State Department, we're playing for keeps here. Now, when they ask a family member of Saeed Abedini to do something, fill out a form, then when he goes to fill out that form in Iran, his penalty is not $50 if you don't fill out the form correctly under penalty of perjury. It could be the death penalty himself. So they were asking ridiculous and unnecessary activities from family members. And that's what I had to stop. I had to get a focus in that meeting as to what the government should be concentrating on. And that was asking for his release. But it was a good meeting. Ambassador Cook is going to be personally involved from here on. And uh, the Bureau of DLR has assured us that they're going to be working on the case, which has not been the case in the past. So that's a big victory and we're going to hold them to it. Ultimately, that led to bigger things. That led to eventually, they may not have showed up at the congressional hearing, but ultimately, President Obama was making remarks about it. Secretary of State John Kerry was making remarks about it. So ultimately, they did start speaking out. You had the President of the United States in the first phone call with a senior representative of Iran. In that particular case, a direct call with the President of Iran and President Obama asked for the release of Saeed Abedini. John Kerry called for the release of Saeed Abedini by name. So at that point, I think it's fair to say that our meeting with the State Department gave direct results. Now, it has not been the end result, which is getting him free, but it, had, it did bring about a change of position and a public advocacy now, not just by us, but by the United States government. We pray for Pastor Saeed Abedini. He's been held in Iran for more than 18 months sentenced to eight years in prison on charges relating to his Christian beliefs. And as we continue to work for his freedom today, again, we call on the Iranian government to release Pastor Abedini so he can return to the loving arms of his wife and children in Idaho. As a pastor, uh, I am very concerned for Saeed Abedin because they have beaten him and tortured him to try to get him to recant uh, his faith in Jesus Christ because he believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Christ died for our sins on the cross, that he shed his blood, that he was raised from the dead. He believes this. And they have beaten him and tortured him to try uh, to force him to turn his back on his Savior and he won't do it. And uh, the President and this administration uh, have not done what they should be doing to get him out. The uh, subcommittees will come to order, and this is a, uh, an important meeting of two subcommittees, the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organizations, and Subcommittee on Middle East and North Africa. You know, we started back in March at the Lantos Commission, and now here we are uh, months later. The United States in an unprecedented move that we did not predict or could not predict then is now sitting with Iran. At such a critical juncture, with the US government literally sitting across the table from Iran, we could never have imagined that that would occur when we first testified before the Lantos Commission in March. At the table, for the first time in 34 years, we need to ensure that Pastor Saeed and the other Americans mentioned here today, wrongfully detained, are seen as not a marginal issue, but an essential of those ongoing diplomatic talks. Pastor Saeed has exhausted all legal remedies in Iran to appeal this arbitrary conviction and his detention. His freedom now rests solely on the success of diplomatic efforts by the United States government and world leaders dedicated to human rights. 
And just to highlight again, that while our government sat across the table from the Iranian delegation, Saeed was transferred to a worse prison. When I spoke in front of the Tom Lantos uh, Human Rights Commission in March of this year, um, I had anticipated that I would battle the Iranian government for my husband's freedom. I never anticipated that I would also ha have to battle my own government and that the journey would become even much more difficult than it, has, it had been. His parents, when they visit him in prison, they say that when they hold the uh, pictures of the kids in front of him, he just cries. And he wrote in a letter, he said, it is so hard and so heartbreaking for me, to, for me to see these pictures and to know that I'm not there beside you as you grow. I came here to help the kids that did not have mommies and daddies, but my own kids lost their daddy. This breaks my heart so much. I want you to know that I did not want to put so much pressure on your little shoulders, my precious children. Zabedidi, thank you so very much for those powerful words. Uh, and that testimony is, is just... Um, I think it causes every one of us to redouble our efforts and, and do everything possible to ensure that your husband is released immediately. Thank so you. thank you so very much. And a lot of times when there was a different table and this room was different and the table was here, our dad used to be here swinging us in circles. And that was our favorite, that's our favorite part. Well, we, me and my brother and my dad were in, in the playroom at November 11, 2009. And we were just taking pictures there and Jacob was one years old and I was three. My favorite page is this one because my dad's holding me and it's been a long time since he did. Today marks a day of both sorrow and hope. Sorrow for the two years that Pastor Saeed Abedini has languished in an Iranian prison and hope for his release. Two years, that's how long U.S. citizen Saeed Abedini has been imprisoned in Iran. Saeed's only crime, his Christian faith. For two years, Saeed has been held captive in a foreign land. For two years, his wife has been without a husband. And for two years, Saeed's two young children have been without a father. Two years of missed birthdays, anniversaries, and other events. I ask all of you to join me today in calling again for Saeed's release and safe return home. There's absolutely nothing that's going to bring those two years back to Saeed's family. There is nothing that will bring those two years back. But enough is enough. Enough is enough. It's time to bring Saeed Abedini home. This injustice has continued for far too long. It's time. 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 When we were doing the Save Saeed campaign, we really came in every morning to the office and said, what can we do today? Who can we call today? And we basically started reaching out to people that we knew personally and said, hey, could you come in? Can you do a video for Saeed? Can you help out? Can you tweet for Saeed? Can you uh, post on your social media for Saeed? And what we found is we found a great group of individuals who had large social uh, outreach thousands and thousands of Twitter followers, thousands of Facebook followers, and they were all coming in and willing to lend their voice for Saeed. Your signature could save a life. Save Saeed. Save Saeed. Save Saeed. Would you please save Saeed? Save Saeed. Sign our petition at savesaeed.org. What we saw was we had so many people that wanted to get involved. We had so many people that cared about this story that we eventually grew that petition to over 600,000 names. Um, every day we would come in and the number would just keep rolling and keep rolling and we saw how passionate people were about the story. And that's when we knew that we needed to start Be Her Project. That's when we knew that we needed a specific place to amplify these stories and get them out there on social media.
Whatever anybody thinks of the United Nations, the fact of the matter, it's an international tribunal that exists, that has influence, and you have to understand how to negotiate it. So we fought years ago to become a non-governmental organization, an NGO with the United Nations through our office in Europe, our European Center for Law and Justice in Strasbourg, France. And we did that at the time dealing with issues of what I would call religious discrimination. And then of course when the religious persecution issues developed really since 9-11 at this significance. They've always been there, but at this significance, we were able to utilize our status to become advocates at the UN. And we've made multiple interventions on multiple cases with multiple lawyers from multiple countries. The ECLJ would like to bring to the Council's attention the ongoing human rights violation by the Islamic Republic of Iran in the case of Saeed Abadini, who is currently imprisoned for peaceful private expression of his religion. Said was arrested and during his visit in Iran to build a government-endorsed orphanage. And though he, he was tried and convicted as a national security offense, the basis of his crime was his peaceful association and expression with members of his religious community in private homes. But when Nagme inserts herself into the United Nations, she has personalized it. For them, they can ignore a statistic. They can't ignore the face of somebody who's been persecuted. For nearly a year, the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran has tried to silence my husband, Saeed Abedini, through illegal imprisonment, torture, and threats against our family. Why is he being held? Because he ex exercised his rights of religious freedom, expression, and peaceful assembly. This past week and today, this council has called on member states to recognize and uphold these fundamental freedoms. I hope that my presence here today will put a face to those who suffer when a government does not uphold its obligation to protect these freedoms. Part of the advocacy is, again, it's building that historical record, but it's also being a voice for people who have no voice inside their own country. And then what we can do as a size of organization like we are at the ACLJ, with the voices we're able to put together, we, when we combine all of our voices and everybody out there who joins our petitions and signs on, shares that with their friends and family and talks about it in church, we can take a government who is not used to having to deal with a strong Christian community like Iran or Sudan or, you know, the list goes on, Pakistan. And suddenly it's not just their Christian community, now it's the whole world. So it's a multi-pronged attack. I mean, when you're talking about advocacy, we have media advocacy. You use radio, television, there's social media advocacy, which is becoming huge. Facebook, Twitter, other forms of social advocacy, social media advocacy. And then of course it's advocacy in the tribunals. Most of these cases end up at the United Nations or some form of United Nations oversight. So you advocate as lawyers or government affairs professionals at the UN. So the European Center for Law and Justice is accredited at the United Nations, which allows us really incredible opportunity to do what we call multilateral negotiations with countries. So you have situations where maybe the United States or countries in Europe don't have diplomatic relation, but other countries do. So it's an avenue to advocate for both an issue and specific cases, to engage with countries that we wouldn't otherwise have access to, to ask them to intervene, to step in, to uphold the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it's a very invaluable opportunity, one that not everyone gets. At the ACLJ, we always try to engage these cases in a number of ways. Two of the ones that are the most important, of course, the legal side. That's what we do best. We are legal advocates uh, for these victims of religious persecution. Syed Abedini, we legally represent the Abedini family in all matters that pertain to the case. But there's another component of this. There's telling the story. At the ACLJ, we try to merge those two things. Signing petitions is a huge thing because you get attention to a cause when you can say, we have 600,000 people we've heard from. Now that, what that does allows us to amplify their voice. So it's not just one person speaking in Iowa. It's 600,000 people speaking literally from coast to coast and sometimes from around the globe. So petition signing, petition engagement is a way to express your opinion. We have a very large reach, thanks to our members, of people who are engaged in these issues, people who care about these cases. And so more than just doing the legal work, we can also tell the story. We can also reach uh, millions of people with these stories so that they can in turn make a difference. But we've also encouraged people to talk directly with their members of Congress, directly with their members of the United States Senate, with government leaders. We've asked them to call the White House, 
These are the things you do. We also do briefs. So when we file an intervention at the United Nations, we will say we're representing 300,000 people or 600,000 people, and that has a big impact. Petitions are very important, especially um, to motivate governments to move, and that speaks very powerfully to our government, both at the congressional level the, and the executive level with our State Department. In all of these cases, there's a role for us to play. In the case of Syed Abedini, we represent the Abedini family. In some of these other cases, like Miriam Ibrahim, we do not represent the family, and yet there's a role for us to play. We have raised the visibility of Miriam's case, and the result in that case was a very good one. In the case of Syed Abedini, there are others who have come alongside us and assisted us as we represent the Abedini family. So no matter the case, there is always a role for each of us to play. And if we're gonna achieve results, we've gotta make sure that all of us are stepping up and doing what we can. Our leaders need to be continuously putting the names of these imprisoned Christians who are peaceable people, they didn't cause any problems in their society, are imprisoned because of their faith, because of their religious beliefs. Our leaders need to be keeping their names before the American people and before the world and before the leaders of Iran and other countries. In Sudan, a court has sentenced a woman to death for renouncing Islam. The woman was convicted under Sudan's barbaric Sharia law. It forbids women from marrying non-Muslim men. Human rights groups in Western countries, including the U.S., all condemning the sentencing. Miriam Yahia Ibrahim, seen here on her wedding photo, was sentenced to death for apostasy because she married a Christian. Ibrahim also has a 20-month-old son who stays with her in her prison cell. The court gave Miriam an opportunity to recant her Christian faith, but Ibrahim refused to do so, reportedly telling the court, I am a Christian and I will remain a Christian. Well, this is barbaric. There's no other way to describe it. And, uh, and the crime that uh, she's principally accused of is apostasy. That is to say, leaving Islam and refusing to come back. In America, we call switching religions freedom of religion. Uh, and it just demonstrates the risk when uh, Sharia law is implemented uh, to the fullest extent. The court also ordered that Ibrahim be given 100 lashes for committing zina, Arabic for illegitimate sex for having sexual relations with her Christian husband, Daniel Wani. Wani is a U.S. citizen. There's a huge failure in, on behalf of the United States. The husband, Daniel, had even been trying to get a visa for his wife and child to come to the U.S. prior to this. And there were many complications and it still hasn't been processed. If there is any good news, it is that there is still time to save Miriam's life. Also developing tonight, a big victory for religious freedom. Miriam Ibrahim, the Sudanese woman sentenced to death for being a Christian, is free and even got a blessing from the Pope. The Italian and U.S. governments reportedly working to free the new mother and fly her to safety in Rome last night. You know, with Miriam Ibrahim's situation, it was clear Sudan is a definitely, it's a country that supports a lot of terrorism. The U.S. has had a very uh, a difficult relationship with Sudan because of their support of terrorism around the world. We're not practicing law in Sudan. Uh, we're not talking to our lawyers in Sudan because it doesn't work that way with some of these governments. So how you work a case when you're not directly representing them or directly in contact with their lawyers is you bring a light to it. You do it through issue advocacy in the media, you do it through governmental advocacy. These are human rights cases. So it's the world's case. It's not necessarily one person's case. So when people ask you why, uh, you know, with Miriam Ibrahim's situation, what could you do? Well, we, we weren't the lawyers, we don't have an office in Sudan. Uh, we weren't the lawyers on the ground, but we were able to bring hundreds of thousands of people to that story in international outcry, not just from America, but international outcry. President Obama's plane is just moments away from touching down at Gowan Field. There is Air Force One, the president making his first visit to Idaho as sitting president. This is Jay Sekulow. We've got a big announcement moments away. Folks, your voice was heard. That's an understatement. Uh, Jordan, what's the latest? Big thank you to so many of you who have spoken out because President Obama is going to be meeting with Nagme and her children 
when he's in the hometown of the Abedini family, Saeed's hometown as well of Boise, Idaho. But that is happening this afternoon. Well, folks, I want to let you know exactly here what's happening. 105,000 of you signed on to this uh, letter to the president. Uh, a lot of you made phone calls as well. In God's timing, we now have a meeting this afternoon between the president of the United States, the commander-in-chief, President Obama, and Nagme Abedini. You know, it's actually a lot of energy outside as people, the line is long, people are excited, everyone we talked to, and then there was a rally for the Abedini family. Uh, Nagme, as we know now, is going to meet with the president prior to his speech about her husband, Saeed, and there was a rally outside, a, a rather large one, actually. A lot of people came out in support of Saeed and being able to free him from the Iranian prison. I remember the first things that came out in the Idaho statement said, we don't even know why he's coming to Boise. For me, it was very special, not necessarily just because of President Obama, but just because I knew God had ordained the meeting. After President Obama walked in and shook the kids' hands and my hands, he sat down. First, he was pretty formal and was talking about how they were trying very hard to get Saeed home. He was a top priority. He mentioned the Cuban uh, prisoner that was recently released and how they kept going at it until he was released and that that's what they were gonna do with Saeed. And then I just said, you know, um, President Obama, uh, I just want you to know the kids and I love you and we pray for you often. And I said, I don't know if this is, this is professional to say that or not. And, and the walls dropped and he just grabbed my hand. And he said, no, you said it perfect. Well, uh, one of the things he did was connect me with the ambassador at large for religious freedom, international religious freedom. And I felt like there was a dent made today that um, let's, you know, especially getting the ambassador involved in, uh, in, in Saeed's issue and trying to, you know, get more of a movement in terms of religious uh, freedom issues. Uh, Jacob said, President Obama, can you make sure he comes home for my birthday? He looked at Jacob and he said, Jacob, I will try very hard to do that. I will try very hard. He said it a couple times and I saw his father's side come out. I don't know, it, I, I could see emotion and I could see that I want to be there for my kids' birthdays. That was a side where, you know, for a few seconds, we all forgot he was the president and we could see the father's side come out, the, uh, the nurturing side of saying, Jacob, I'm going to try for you. I'm going to try to get you this present. And it was just very emotional. Religious persecution thrives in darkness. The hope for turning around the tide of religious persecution around the world uh, really lies in opening the eyes of the American people who are free, who are free from religious persecution to the plight of their brothers and sisters around the world. That will shed light on this very serious problem. And just the presence of light is gonna make religious persecution diminish. Hope will begin to materialize when there's less corruption and less religious fanaticism. The only really hope uh, for us, and we know it, uh, the, the secular world does not understand it, is for many of these people come to Christ. And we have so many people, Muslims, who came to Christ and they turned from persecutors to evangelists, literally, all over the Arab world. And uh, so the only hope I see, uh, short of the coming of the Lord Jesus, is a continuation of taking an intensifying of taking the gospel uh, both on the air but also on the ground with foot soldiers, particularly those who came to Christ from Islam. Well, their ultimate hope, of course, is in Jesus. That's their hope. Their other hope is that, and it's true, that not just tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but millions of people, people they will never meet, they have never met from around the globe, are praying for them and advocating on their behalf. I think we can be a voice in our members in the ACLJ, we, first through prayer and through hard work. Uh, we have seen results in these cases. Uh, we have been successful. And, and again, it's the voice that we need because these people cannot speak for, the, for themselves. So they need somebody who, who speaks for them with a prayerful and, uh, voice and, and hard work. In each one of these situations, you have to see 
the, the reality of what can you do. So the hope for me is saving a life, saving a community, saving a church, saving a village or a, a town, and making sure people are brought to justice. There is hope in justice as well. There's a lot we can do about it. There's a lot of hope there. There's a lot of progress that can be made. We have more freedom in the United States of America than anyone else in the world. If we don't use that freedom to advocate for these people suffering under religious persecution, who will? Well, we have no guarantee that persecution's gonna diminish. In fact, Jesus said the opposite. He said they will persecute you. So our job though, our legal job, is to try to eradicate that. That doesn't mean we're gonna be successful in every case. We won't be successful in every case. But our job is to demand that international law is followed, that human rights laws are followed, that these governments are held accountable and governments we're supporting are held accountable so that they can't just freehand persecute people that they disagree with because they happen to be Christians. I really do believe that stemming the tide of religious persecution, the hope for stemming that tide, lies in opening the eyes of the American people, raising their awareness of the fact that of, of just how prevalent this is around the world, and making it a priority for them. If we do that, if our generation, if the American people have their eyes open to this problem, they will continue to talk about it, they will continue to engage, they will continue to advocate, and as a result, we're going to win more victories than ever before. I love him, and when he comes back, I'll be super, 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 I'll be the various, various, various happy person in the world, and never, maybe, never stop being happy, and I love him so, 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 so much. I, lo I love him and take good care of him and don't let him die and bring him home safely. Amen. When this ordeal started, Said's kids were very young. And as they became more and more aware of what was happening to their daddy, they knew that they had a role to play too. The children and the family decided um, several years in that they wanted to be involved. They wanted to be seen and they wanted to have a voice and a part in bringing daddy home. you tonight to pray for Pastor Saeed, pray for his family as well, and pray for others that are held captive because of their faith in Jesus Christ. But let's be like that woman who continues to petition for justice, and let's not leave this place ever forgetting that people are in prison because of what they believe and who they believe in. Let us remember that tonight. Let us go forward from this place remembering those that are persecuted because of their belief and their stand for Jesus Christ, wherever it might be. Amen. As Americans, we live in a land where these freedoms are not challenged in the way that we see them being challenged all over the rest of the world. In our freedom and what we stand for, 
the fact that our country was founded on the principle of religious freedom almost obligates us as Americans to be the voice for those who don't have a voice. To be honest with you, it is so painful. It drives me to tears every day. And I think I can only do it because our Lord is there helping me, encouraging me, keeping me moving forward. And we will not stop. We had the loveliest people I've ever met. And we're going to keep going. And we're going to keep serving everybody, keep loving everybody. It's the throngs of millions speaking out for those that can't speak out for themselves that really makes the difference at the end of the day. And what I really want to get across to the Christians around the world is don't forget us. We are your brothers and sisters. I say to you, please don't leave us. We need you. Uh, I know who writes the last pages of history. And I know that the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes back for his church. I know that he's gonna come back and he's gonna judge one day. And uh, this world, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue one day will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And I want them to know that Christ died for them, that he was shed his blood, he was buried, but he rose triumphantly from the grave. He's not in the grave, he's alive, and he can come into their heart and they can be changed for eternity. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' faith and righteousness. Our hope is in our Lord, who is the God of hope. Last year we prayed together for Pastor Saeed Abedini, detained in Iran since 2012. And I was recently in Boise, Idaho, and had the opportunity to meet uh, with Pastor Abedini's uh, beautiful wife and wonderful children and to convey to them that our country has not forgotten Brother Saeed and that we're doing everything we can to bring him home. And, then I received an extraordinary letter from Pastor Abdini. And in it, he describes his captivity and expressed his gratitude for my visit with his family and thanked us all for standing in solidarity with him during his captivity. And Pastor Abdini wrote, nothing is more valuable to the body of Christ
Christ than to see how the Lord is in control and moves ahead of countries and leadership through united prayer. And he closed his letter by describing himself as prisoner for Christ, who is proud to be part of this great nation, the United States of America, that cares for religious freedom around the world. And we're going to keep up this work for Pastor Abedini and all those around the world who are unjustly held or persecuted because of their faith. 